a great pleasure to be here. I speak to you today as a professor at University of California, Berkeley, although I am a co-founder of some companies that are using gene editing. And um, you know, I've been struck at this meeting by the, the incredible advances being made in information technology, and certainly living in the Bay Area, we experience that uh, very directly. But I think uh, what's really interesting to me is that there's a parallel explosion going on in biology right now, and that's really what I want to talk to you about this morning, a, a technology that is enabling manipulation of the information that controls biological systems that I think you'll see very nicely parallel some of the things that we've heard about uh, earlier in the meeting. So uh, to, to kick this off, you know, this is really a, a technology that is about rewriting the language of life, rewriting the DNA that controls the cells, organisms uh, that we see around us and, and, and that are us. And, um, and it really begins with thinking about the way that information is stored in biological systems. So unlike in computers where we store information electronically, ones and zeros, in biology, information is stored chemically. It's stored in the form of DNA. And this is, the, this is showing you the beautiful structure of DNA, the double helix that was discovered back in the 1950s. And in fact, when I was growing up in Hawaii, I was growing up in a rural town in Hawaii. Nobody in my family was a scientist. But the way I got turned on to biology was by reading a book my dad gave me about the discovery of the structure of DNA. And I was so amazed by the fact that scientists could do experiments to understand the structure of a molecule that that's actually what got me excited about going into biochemistry and structural biology. Um, so you know, when we look at the structure like this, uh, th this is basically showing how information is stored in the form of letters of DNA. You, know that you might know that DNA has four letters, and the thing that makes it so useful for storing information is that the letters pair with other letters to form the double helix. And that's how information can be replicated accurately and stored for future generations. Now, um, ever since the discovery of the structure of DNA, scientists have been thinking about how they could manipulate that molecule, how we could synthesize it, how we could, we could uh, make copies of it, and also how we could change it. Could you actually alter the information inside of a cell in a way that would allow manipulation of that information very precisely? It sounds uh, sort of like science fiction. Um, but the idea really was, could you have, could you really create some kind of an editor for DNA? Sort of analogous to the way that we might have uh, an editor in our, in our, uh, to edit a document on our computer where we can move in, uh, text around, we can change it, cut and paste things, correct a typo. What if you could actually do that in the DNA of a cell? It kind of sounds like science fiction, right? But scientists have been thinking about this for the last few decades and, and, and sort of chipping away at how to do this. And technologies have been coming along for making changes precisely to the DNA of cells. The challenge has been that those technologies have not been widely adopted. Why not? Because they were hard enough to use and they, there's sort of a high enough energy barrier that most scientists, like me, had looked at those earlier technologies and said, well, that looks really exciting, but it looks too hard to use. And so the story that I want to tell you today is about a technology for gene editing that came about from a very unexpected direction. Research that I was doing with my collaborator, Emmanuel Charpentier, that was directed in a very different uh, in a different direction, we thought, than gene editing initially. And it was really about a curiosity-driven project to understand how bacteria fight viral infection. And it was through the course of that research that we uncovered a mechanism that cells use to fight viral infection that could actually be repurposed, re-harnessed as a technology for gene editing. And it's a technology that's become known as CRISPR. So, to, to explain uh, how this works a little bit, I want to first show you that you know, all cells are susceptible to viral infection. So this is an example of a virus landing on the surface of a bacterial cell. And in this example, uh, and this, this actually happens, in bacteria, the DNA of this virus is packaged inside the head, that sort of round uh, structure in the virus, <laughs> under very high pressure. And when the virus lands on the surface of the cell, it's literally like harpooning the cell, injecting the DNA into the cell, 
where that DNA of the virus very rapidly takes over the machinery of the cell. This is true for any kind of viral infection in, in us or bacteria and other kinds of organisms. In bacteria, when this uh, process begins, the cell has very little time to defend itself from the virus before it gets killed. So there's a really high selective pressure for cells to come up with strategies to defend themselves. And one of those strategies is a system called CRISPR. It's an adaptive immune system that allows cells to recognize this foreign DNA, steal little pieces of it, store it in the DNA of the cell at a place in the genome called CRISPR. So it keeps a genetic record of, the, of viruses that have infected these cells over time. And then it makes a chemical copy of the DNA in the form of a related molecule called RNA that provides the cell with a, a way to program a, a, its immune system to find and destroy viral DNA that has a matching uh, letter sequence. What does that mean? Well, uh, let me just show you, <laughs> let, me, let, me show, let me show you the, the actual machinery that does this, and then I'm gonna show you a little video that illustrates how it works. Okay, so this is a 3D printed model of the actual molecule that carries out gene editing. It's a molecule, it's a protein called Cas9, shown here in the, it's the white uh, molecule. And the great thing about this technology is that this protein, Cas9, can be used for any experiment of gene editing in any cell. And the reason it can work with any, in any cell and recognize any sequence of DNA is that it, it's programmed with a replaceable piece of RNA. That's the orange molecule in this model. The orange molecule has a series of letters that match the sequence of letters in DNA that, uh, that, a, ba that a bacterium might want to find and, and destroy if it's a virus, but as a technologist, we might want to use it to program uh, to find uh, a certain sequence in the genome of a cell to make a change. And the way this system works is that the protein, the white molecule with its programmable uh, RNA, uh, orange molecule, searches through DNA in the cell, the blue double helix, to find a sequence of letters matching the RNA sequence. And when that match occurs, this protein grabs onto the DNA at that position, and it makes a very precise cut in the DNA double helix. Now, when that happens in animal and plant cells, the cell can actually take over, repair the cut, and in the course of repairing the cut, make a change to the DNA at that position. Okay, so let me show you a, a video that illustrates how we imagine that this actually works inside of an animal or a plant cell. So we're looking at a cell, and of course in animals and plants, the DNA is actually packaged inside the nucleus of the cell. So we're zooming in here to the nucleus, and you'll see that the blue DNA is wrapped around some green proteins that uh, allow the DNA to be highly compacted inside the nucleus. Now the amazing thing about the CRISPR technology is that this programmable enzyme, Cas9, searches through all of the letters of the DNA in the nucleus to find a single set of letters, 20 letters, that match the letters in the RNA. And when that match occurs, the DNA opens up, this protein cuts the DNA, and then it hands off those broken ends of the DNA to repair enzymes in the cell that can fix the break. And in this example, we're seeing actually insertion of a new piece of information at the site of the break. That's what make this, makes this very powerful. You can control where changes occur in the DNA by triggering this repair pathway by introducing a break. Now the remarkable thing about this technology is that it works in essentially any kind of plant uh, or animal or fungal or any other type of organism where it's been tested. So it's very powerful. It's a democratizing technology because it's simple to deploy. Any student, we've had high school students come to the lab, they can take out their iPhone, they can type in a sequence of letters uh, that they want to synthesize in the form of RNA, they can order it from a company, and within a couple of days, they can be programming this enzyme Cas9 to make genetic changes to human cells or any other kind of cells that they are, they're interested in studying. So it's a really remarkable, really powerful uh, technology for doing something that not long ago seemed 
like uh, science fiction. So uh, where do we go from here? Um, I want to point out that, that uh, you know, the, the way that this technology is being deployed right now, so we're, we're already seeing multiple clinical trials that have started uh, already to test this, initially in cancer patients, but probably in the not distant future to test uh, the system also for treating genetic diseases in mouse models of muscular dystrophy or uh, uh, of uh, HIV AIDS uh, infection. We've already seen efficacy using the CRISPR technology to treat uh, these animal models of disease. So there's tremendous excitement about this. Um, and also, of course, in agriculture, uh, excitement about being able to engineer plants precisely to allow them to adapt to climate change and other kinds of, uh, of attacks that are, are happening, pathogens that might attack plants. Um, all of these types of, of changes, uh, at least certainly in, in, uh, in clinical medicine right now, are being done in cells that we call somatic cells. They're fully differentiated cells, cells uh, that are, exist in, in, in kids or adults. They're not cells that are going to pass uh, changes on to the future, future generations. But one of the things to appreciate about this technology is because it works in effectively any cell type, it can also be done, uh, this kind of gene editing can be done in, uh, in what we call the germline. And this is an example of germline editing. So what you're seeing here is a pipette on the left-hand side that's holding on to a fertilized egg. This is actually a fertilized mouse egg. And a needle coming in from the right that's injecting the gene editing molecules into this fertilized embryo. And when that animal uh, then develops, it will have changes that are induced by, this, uh, the, by the injected uh, CRISPR-Cas9 uh, molecules those changes will be transmitted to all of the cells of the organism, and not only that, to their uh, children, children's children, et cetera. So these become heritable changes. And it was appreciated early on with this technology that this works very nicely in mice. It turns out it works in lots of other kinds of organisms. Um, I wanted to show you one example of this, it sort of illustrating how, how simple uh, this is to do, and also how beautiful uh, a result one can get with this kind of germline editing. So this is an experiment that was done by a first-year graduate student at the University of Texas, and she was kind enough to share this with me, Sunata uh, Kadka. And what Sunata did in this experiment was she took frog embryos. These are two-cell embryos, so they have two cells, and there's, the cells are split, right? This uh, round uh, embryos, there are two cells on each side of the, the round uh, embryo. Uh, and uh, she injected the CRISPR molecules into one of the two cells in such a way that she removed a gene important for making the brown color of these frogs and replaced it with a gene that makes the, frog, uh, makes the cell uh, glow green. And so you see these beautiful embryos with one cell glowing green, the other cell uh, uh, un unedited. And when these animals, these animals are otherwise completely normal, these are allowed to develop. These are the tadpoles that develop. And you can see that in the, in the image on, the, on, on, on your left, uh, these animals have, uh, have a uh, split right down the center with the, the uh, normal brown color dis, uh, has, has, uh, is gone from the cells on the bottom of the animal. And you see on the right-hand side, replaced by the green gene. So it's a very, very interesting, very powerful uh, technology. And this is something that was done by a, by a first year graduate student. So it turns out that this kind of germline editing works in other animals. It also works in uh, mammals. It works in, in monkeys. And a, an experiment that was published in early 2014 illustrated this, in which monkeys uh, that were treated in the same way that I just showed you uh, with the, the frog embryos were edited in the germline so that the resulting animals could pass on those genetic changes to their progeny. And for me, this was kind of the moment when I realized that as excited I, as I was about this technology, um, I, I started to feel a little bit nervous because you know, this, this technology is, is powerful enough that it can also allow changes to be made, heritable changes to be made in human beings. And um, this was actually a cover of The Economist from a, about a year ago under the banner Editing Humanity uh, with, the, you know, with the articles talking about the, the uh, exciting challenges that we now face where we have a technology that can allow correction 
of mutations that would cause disease, but also potentially uh, introduce changes to human populations that lead to uh, uh, changes in traits that some might consider enhancements. And um, should we go there? Is this something that, uh, that, that should happen? And just to give you a flavor of how fast the technology is moving. So I, I spoke about this last year, uh, last summer at, at, uh, at Google Camp. And just in that, in that amount of time, so it's not quite a year, this technology has now moved to the point where it's possible now to make uh, cells from human somatic cells, so fully differentiated cells, it's now possible to make uh, eggs and sperm, certainly in mice and probably very soon in human beings, that will obviate the need to do embryo editing. We won't have to do that. We can edit eggs and sperm of people and then use those edited germ cells to, uh, for fertilization if that were desired. So the pace of the technology is unbelievably fast. And I think that you know, it's really important for scientists and frankly all of us to appreciate the wonderful opportunities it offers but also the real challenges uh, that we face now uh, with ethical decisions about how to use this technology appropriately. Thank you very much.